what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI, 124 Queen Street, Durban. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الآن أيها الإخوة والأخوات نحيي ضيفنا الكبير الشيخ أحمد ديدات أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقالوا لولا أنزل عليه آيات من ربه قل إنما الآيات عند الله وإنما أنا نذير مبين أولم يكفهم أن أنزلنا عليك الكتاب يطلع عليهم إن في ذلك لرحمة وذكرة لقوم يؤمنون صدق الله صدق الله من الرزيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, the subject is Al-Quran, a miracle of miracles. I have read to you a verse from the Holy Quran. As we proceed, I will explain the verse and what Allah Baridala says about this subject of miracles. But let me explain to you what a miracle is. What is a miracle? A mojiza. A miracle is an impossibility. Something beyond human endeavor, human effort. For example, one of us, while this meeting is carrying on, he falls unconscious and he expires. A doctor is called up and the doctor certifies that the person is dead. Another doctor is brought forward to give his opinion and he also certifies that the man is dead. Take the body away, prepare for burial. But there comes along a man of God, sees this dead person, dead body, and he says, he commands, Kum bi iznillah. Wake up, get up in the name of Allah and the person gets up alive and well. We say it's a miracle because it was an impossibility certified by two doctors and yet the person has come back to life. Miracle. But suppose the man was dead for three days, put in a mortuary, in a morgue. And after three days somebody comes along, the man is gone as hard as rock and he shouts at the cops, Kum biiznillah. Arise in the name of Allah and the man comes back from the dead, from the mortuary, from the morgue. We say that is a greater miracle because it's a greater impossibility. But after the person is dead and buried, his bones have rotted in the grave and somebody cries, Kumbi and the person gets out of the grave alive, 
breathing well, we say that is still a greater miracle. So greater the impossibility, the greater the miracle. I hope this definition, you know, is simple enough for everybody to grasp. Now in that sense, the Quran is a miracle of eloquence. In the first instance, you see, nations before Islam were sent prophets. And mankind had a tendency to demand proof by some supernatural acts. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, the holy prophet Moses, he was given a type of miracle which was akin to magic. He was among the magicians in, in Egypt. So he had to contend with these magicians and Allah gave him a miracle to confound these magicians. Firaun, thinking that Musa -Islam was another magician, he brought forth his own magicians to play the part. And the magicians, the Egyptian magicians, they had little, little magic sticks, or magic wands, and they threw them on the ground. And all these little sticks became little, little snakes, serpents. Allah Bari Ta'ala had already given Hazrat Musa -Islam an experience with his rod on the mount. Now he knew what he was to do. So he threw his rod and the rod turned into a serpent. And this serpent swallowed up all the little snakes of the Egyptians. And Hazrat Musa -Salam picked up the serpent and it turned back once more into a rod. And the Egyptian magicians, they realized that this is no magic. This is not hypnotism. This is not mesmerism. Because to hypnotize a person, you cast a spell. You make the person to see what is really not there. It's an illusion is created. The sticks, you can make it appear like snakes by casting a spell. But here, all the little sticks had vanished. To demesmerize, it would have been to make the snakes to appear as sticks. No, no, no. But these sticks had vanished into the serpent and the serpent was a rod and the rod was no thicker than what it was before. A greater miracle. And the Egyptian magicians, they confessed that this is no magic. This is something beyond. It was a miracle, a real miracle, not magic. So Allah gives miracles according to the mentality, the needs of the people. People with magical minds, they were confounded with magic, superior magic. Real magic. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, when he appears on the scene, he comes among a people who were steeped in Greek medicine. They were performing wonders with, with medicine. So Allah gives him healing powers. Healing those born blind. A person who goes blind by shock or by some damage, infection, is quite a different thing from one who is born blind. And Allah bari ta'ala gave him those powers of healing those who were born blind and the lepers and he gave life back to the dead revive the dead bismillah type of miracle to convince the people our nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam he comes among a people who were boasting about their language the language was the boast their eloquence their poetry they said we are an eloquent people we are the arabs and the rest of the world is ajam, dumb, compared to us. They boasted. They would ask, this is you, in your language, you ajami. How many words have you got for a horse in your language? Synonyms for a horse. Oh man, so maybe half a dozen. He says, you see, we can give you a hundred in our language. He says, how many words, synonyms you have for a sword? Oh. Anybody will say half a dozen. He said, you see, in my language, I can give you a hundred. So you see, we are the eloquent people and you people are all dumb, ajam. So among such a people, when he comes along, the greatest miracle that he gave was the Quran. That the language of the Quran, in the first instance, was beating the people. And they realized, people with sense, that this is not poetry, this is not uh, prose, this is something beyond our understanding, and people accepted the faith. 
But let me tell you what a non-Muslim, non-Muslims, they have to say about the Quran and its eloquence. A.J. Arbery, an Englishman who translated the Holy Quran into English, in his preface he says, whenever I hear the Quran chanted, is a foreigner. He had just learned Arabic. Arabic is not his mother tongue. And he says, whenever I hear the Quran chanted, meaning beautifully recited, it is as though I'm listening to music. Underneath the flowing melody, there is sounding all the time the insistent beat of a drum. It is like the beating of my heart. You can't help vibrating on the wavelength of the Quran. Then Reverend Bosworth Smith, a Christian missionary, he wrote a book on Muhammad and Muhammadanism. In this book, he says about our Nabi Karim وسلم, and the Holy Quran, he says, illiterate himself, an ummi, scarcely able to read or write, he was yet the author of a book, which we do not agree, that Muhammad وسلم, was not the author of the book. He says, according to his belief, understanding that Muhammad وسلم, is the author of this book. See, he is yet the author of a book, which is a poem, a code of laws, a book of common prayers, and a Bible all in one. And is reverenced to this day by a sixth of the whole human race as a miracle. As a miracle of purity, of style, of wisdom, and of truth. It is the one miracle claimed by Muhammad. His standing miracle, he called it. And a miracle indeed it is. Without doubt, it is a mochiza. An enemy testifies that this is a miracle indeed. And Allah draws our attention to this. In the verse I read to you from the Holy Quran, from Surah An-Kabut, chapter 29. I'm coming to it. Allah says, Waqalu, and they say, who are the Muslims? They say, Lawla unzil alayhi ayatun mir rabbi. So why is not a sign, a miracle, a mujiza given to him by his Lord. This is a demand. They had heard about the miracles of Moses. They had heard about the miracles of Jesus. Now they want some similar performance from the Prophet of Islam. Like, for example, they were asking, he says, look, O Muhammad, they were trying to humor him. They were trying to make a mockery of him. So he said, look, O Muhammad, you say you are a Prophet of God. Why don't you perform some miracles? Like the prophets of old. Like this Ohad, Mount Ohad, outside Makkah. Why don't you turn it into gold? Then we will know that you are a true man of God. Or put up a ladder up into heaven. Go up that ladder and bring a book down. Then we will believe that you are a true messenger of God. Or make rivers to gush out in the desert then we will know that you are somebody that we can hearken to. Waqalu, and they say, Lawla unzil alayhi ayatun mir rabbi. In answer to that, Allah makes him to say, Qul, tell them, innama al ayatun in the Allah, so most certainly signs, miracles are in the hands of my Lord, in the hands of Allah. Innama Ana Naziru Mubin. I am only a warner, clear cut, straightforward, plain, simple, warner. Awalam Yakfihim. Is this not enough for you? Awalam Yakfihim. Anna Anzalla Alaikal Kitaba. Yutla Alehim. Say, is this not enough for them that you rehearse to them, that you read to them a book which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad? This book we have revealed to you, O Muhammad. Is that not enough for them? To you, an ummi, a person who doesn't know how to read or write. You are rehearsing this book to them. Is that not enough in itself that it should be a miracle? You know this human child, this little child, Muhammad. He grew, grew up in front of your eyes. And up to the age of 40, he was like your own child. You know every move he made, every things that he did. You know everything about him. And this man, who had had no schooling, now he's coming along and rehearsing the book to them. Is that not enough as a miracle? 
The book itself, Allah says, is a miracle. And a miracle indeed it is. A miracle, in the first instance, we Muslims, we believe that this book is Allah's kalam. Allah Ta'ala revealed it to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The enemies of Islam, they agree that this is the book that Muhammad left. Friends and foe alike, they say, this is the book that Muhammad left. But they say that this is not Allah's kalam. This is Muhammad's cleverness. Very clever man. So we say, look, he was an ummi, an unlearned person. He said, yes, but wasn't he a very clever man? Wasn't he a great speaker? Wasn't he a great thinker? Ah, we would have to agree that he was. He was exceptionally good in all these qualities. Then I said, look, why could he not have rehashed into a beautiful language what he heard from his environment and dished it off as a revelation? It's his handiwork. Allah testifies against that. He says, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ He says, he does not speak from his own desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْنُ يُوحَىٰ It is no less than an inspiration sent down to him. عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْكُوَىٰ He is taught by one mighty in power. We believe that this is Allah's kalam. Allah testifies and we testify. But the outsider, he says, no, this is Muhammad's handiwork. So I am telling you, my brothers and sisters, let us for a moment agree with the skeptic, with the cynic, with the critic. Let's agree with him and admit that this is Muhammad's book, that he is the author, though we know he is not. So he said, all right, so you say this is Muhammad's production. He says, yes. So now I want you to agree with me that this is a one-man job, one-man effort. If he did it, this is Muhammad's own handiwork. So well, there's no hesitation in accepting that, that this is his handiwork. I said, all right. In that case, I said, now I present to you this book in its material magnitude, in its size. This is one man job. You have here another job, which you claim to be Allah's Kalam, the Bible. This Bible consists of the Old Testament, which is actually the book of the Jews, and the New Testament, old and new put together, the Christians have inherited it. Old and new put together. In this encyclopedia called the Bible, there are 66 books inside. What we might call surahs, in the Quran we have 114 surahs, they have 66 books, big and small. But these 66 books are authored by 40 different persons. This is what they tell us. 40 different people, the writings lying around, manuscript form, whatever form, that they got them together into one book. 40 different people wrote, went together to produce this one book. This is a one-man production, if at all. <laughs> Out of those 40 different authors of the Bible, the greatest writer, the most voluminous writer, of all is a person called Saint Paul, the real founder of Christianity, Saint Paul. This Saint Paul wrote more than 50% of the books of the New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Out of the 27, Paul wrote 14, more than 50%. But those 14 books put together they don't consist more than this, what I'm showing you now, not more than this. Fourteen put together. The greatest writer, the most learned writer, that's fourteen books. This is one man job. On the physical magnitude of it, we say it's a miracle. And this book, the Quran, is not talking anything, everything, filling up, is a filler. No, no, no. It's a very, very concentrated stuff guiding mankind into all aspects of life, solving all his problems for eternity till Yawm al Qiyamah. So, Allah says, is this not enough for you? 
that this book we have given to this man and ummi. Then the contents of the book. You see, in this book, the Quran, some of these things I'm demonstrating to you. The subject is so vast. Wallah, it take, it'll take a number of talks to deal with the whole subject. And I do not want to hold you people up here till midnight or till early morning. I can. Just on this subject alone, I can keep you all here till one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. But I do not think it's fair or just to you or to me to do such a thing. So I will have to curtail a lot of things because I, as a layman, I can give you a dozen different miracles in the Quran. The learned man, perhaps he can give you a hundred miraculous nature of the Quran. I myself, as a layman, I can give you a dozen, which we will not be able to touch tonight. But I give you a few. Number one, the concept of Allah bari ta'ala. You see, we know Allah by his attributes. And Allah gives us his attributes in his book. We do not have to create these attributes. We have not to concoct them as to what Allah is. So he tells us what he is. He is Ar-Rahman. He is Ar-Rahim. He is Al-Malik. He is Al-Quddus. He is Al-Salam. He is Al-Mu'min. He is Al-Muhaymin. He is Al-Aziz. He is Al-Jabbar. He is Al-Mutakabbir. And on and on and on. He gives us, Allah gives us in his book, 99 beautiful attributes. Like a necklace of pearls, 99 attributes with a crowning glory, Allah, a big pendant, Allah, proper noun, Allah, 99 attributes and one proper name, Allah, makes it a hundred. And I'm asking learned people, doctors, lawyers, philosophers, when I meet them, I say, look, tell me now, I would like to know from you, how many attributes can you imagine? that you can attribute to God. How many? Come, try, try. So he says, well, he is the Father in heaven. I say, yes. He is, God is love. I say, yes. No, no, tell us, whatever. Come on. He is just. I say, yes. He is holy. I say, yes. He is merciful. I say, yes. Come on, come on, come on. You know the cleverest of us, the cleverest of mankind, the most learned of us, he can't go beyond a dozen. He can't imagine with all his learning more than a dozen attributes from his knowledge. He can't. I said, you see, this Ummi, if he did this work, he gives you 99. He said, well, you see, Muhammad was a genius. And a genius can do 10 times better than us. He admits, he's a genius. Still, it is not Allah's Kalam. A genius can do ten times better than what I can. I concede that. I take off my hat to Muhammad. He is great, but he is no prophet. He is not a man sent by God. I said, all right, all right, but now look. In the names that you mentioned, in the first six, the first one was the Father in heaven. But let's say, in a number of tries, in the first half a dozen, you can't help using the word father. They say, Abbana, so our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, O our father, the loving father in heaven. The first half a dozen, you must come out with the word father. He said, yes, anybody. If you try, the father is there, is dangling before everybody, because the Christians have made it famous. The Jews were calling him the father in heaven. And the Christians call him the Father in Heaven. The commonest, this word, Father. I said, you know what? In the list of 99, this word Father is not there. That is a miracle. See, the miracle is that the thing that is being dangled before him for 23 years, people are talking about the Father in Heaven, the Father in Heaven, easiest to take. He doesn't take it. He doesn't catch it. Either consciously or unconsciously. We know it's not his word. It's Allah bari ta'ala. He's making him not to use the word Abba. In Arabic, it's easier than Rabb. He's Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. He's the Lord, cherisher, sustainer of the worlds. He's Rabb, Rabb, Rabb. And Rabb is harder than Abb in Hebrew as well as in Arabic.
is a beautiful expression. The Father in heaven is a beautiful expression. Why wouldn't Muhammad have it? Uh, why wouldn't Allah allow it? You know why? Because this word, this name, this attribute, beautiful attribute, has been abused. It's a beautiful attribute. Words have a tendency to change the meanings. Good words, beautiful words, innocent words. Like the word comrade. You see, this word comrade is like sahab, my friend, my companion. Companion means, in French, person who break bread together, that we eat together, he is my companion. Companion, Spanish means bread. When we break bread together, we are like one brotherhood. Beautiful word. Companion, comrade, beautiful. But you know in the United States, if you address me as comrade did that, you know the, the CIA or the FBI will have me checked up, straight away they'll take me away, you know, to find out what are my philosophies, what am I preaching about, do you know that? I hope you don't use such a word on me. Look, the word is beautiful, look at the dictionary. Dictionary meaning is innocent, good, but it has other associations in people's minds. Comrade associates you with communism. So we eschew it, we won't use it. There are other words. Like gay, G-A-Y, gay. Beautiful word. See, when I was going to school, when I was a young boy, I was teaching us poetry, poetry, English poetry. I still remember. I'm 70 years and four days old now. I still remember. It says, gentle lords and ladies gay, on the mountain dawns the day. Gentle lords and ladies gay, on the mountain dawns the day. Beautiful word. You know, happy and gay. It says happy and gay. He's a jovial person. Ladies, gentlemen, and men, men and women, all. We say, oh, they are very, very happy people. Happy and gay, jolly people, jovial people. Beautiful word. But it has acquired other connotations now. As I was growing up, I'm reading the newspapers, and I read this word gay in there, and it creates some fishy smell. And I don't know what they're talking about. Gay. Gay. It's not the gay that I learned at school. You know, something fishy about it. I didn't catch it for a long time. I couldn't catch it. You know, whenever the word gay occurred in the newspapers, I couldn't catch such a beautiful word. What is this? What they're talking about? It smells. But what the smell is about, because I was using it, gay. I would say I'm happy and gay. Today, if you say that our chairman is happy and gay, you know, you'll only shoot me. You see, innocent word, beautiful word, but has, it has acquired other connotations. Allah tells us in the Quran, "Wala taqulu raina, wa kulum zurna." The verse, the Jews were using this word raina, innocent word. He said, "Look at us, pay attention to us." But they had other meanings attached to it at the back of the mind, as if you are gone off the track. So Allah says, don't use words of ambiguous, ambiguous import. See, you're using the word Raina, but at the back of your mind, you're trying to say something else. So you are gone in the, their own language to say that you are drifting off, you know, you're gone off the track. He says, don't talk like that. Say, unzurna. Don't use words like that. Similarly, words, they change their meaning. The Father in heaven is a beautiful word. But now it has other connotations. In Christendom, they tell us that Jesus is the only begotten Son. Begotten, not made. This is in their catechism. The Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, they're all in the, in the catechism. The religious principles that they expound in the churches teach their children. They say that Jesus is the only begotten Son. Begotten, not made. Don't make a mistake. He's not like Adam. Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. He was made by God. Every dog, pig and donkey was made by God. 
As such, Allah is the creator, sustainer, evolver, his Rabbul Alameen. But Jesus is not like that. He was begotten, not made. And if words have any meaning, what does it mean? They're attributing to Allah bari ta'ala the an animal nature, the lower animal functions of sex. So Allah reacts very strongly in Surah Maryam. He says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدًا And they say that Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. Allah says, لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا عِدَّا is one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. The worst swearing, you want to swear him? This is the worst thing that you can say. That Allah begot a son. You are attributing to him an animal nature. The lower animal functions of sex. Setakadu samawatu yatafattarna minhu. Eti, the skies are ready to burst. Watan shakkal ardu. And the earth to split asunder. Wata khirrul jibalu hadda. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. Anda awlir rahmani walada. That they should say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. That if the heavens had feelings like you, O oh Muslims, Muslimah, if the heavens had feeling, emotions like you, to hear such words being uttered, he said, the heavens would have fallen. If the earth had feelings like you, it would have split asunder, and the mountains fallen down in utter ruin. Such horrible swearing they give Allah. Does it move the Muslim? Not at all. It's not moving anybody. It's an amazing thing, an amazing situation. You see, the non-Arab world, the Muslims of the non-Arab world, 90% of the Muslims of the world are non-Arabs. They don't know Arabic. We have been taught the Quran to read parrot fashion. We read it. Sometimes we read far more beautiful than many Arabs. Some of our Hafiz and Qaris. But we don't understand a word. So we read these beautiful verses. We don't know what Allah is saying. But the Arab world, more than 100 million of you, you understand what Allah is saying, what he's crying about. And it doesn't move anybody. This is an amazing situation, amazing thing. If any of you, my brothers, you go home and your mother tells you, he says, you know, this guy next door, he was swearing me like this. I won't use the words. You know what the other guy was swearing your mother. Or your wife says, you know, this guy next door, you know, he was calling me names. I'm asking, can you eat? Can you sleep? No. What do you do? Say, I want to go and break his jaw, shut him up for good. And if I'm too weak, I say, I hire a gang, somebody to do the job. Now it might cost me 10,000 dirhams. I'll do the job, shut him up for good. No. That's what, how much you feel for your mother, your sister, your wife, your daughter. And yet we say that we love Allah more than all these things. And yet when they swear him, they abuse him, what happens? Nothing, nothing, no reaction. You know why? The spirit is gone out of us. We are the living dead. The living dead. We are on the Sirat al Mustaqim, but we are a dead people. We are, have, we are dead on the right road. The outsider, the enemy, he is on the wrong road, but he's alive. He's alive on the wrong road, we are dead on the right road. <laughs> so Allah reacts. Allah reacts. The worst swearing you can give me is this. What are we to do? I said, talk to them. Reason with them. I don't say go and break the jaws. I don't say go and shoot them, kill them, cut the throats. No, no, no. Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. Wal mawazatil hasanati. And with beautiful preaching. Wajadilhum billati ahsan. And reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. And I show you. Show you some little ways, little ways. I go to the West. I go to England. I go to America. I talk to them. I says, you know, English is a foreign language to me, which it is. It's a foreign language. I acquired this, you know, from, because they conquered my country and I went to a British colony, so they taught me English, so I learned English. If the French had conquered my country, I would be speaking French. If the Spanish had conquered my country, I'd be speaking Spanish. But you Britishers, you English-speaking people conquered my country, so you taught me to speak English, so I'm speaking English to you. But look, it's a foreign language to me. I want you to help me with your language. You say, you say, 
You say in your catechism that Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. I say, will you please explain to me what you are trying to emphasize? You are trying to tell me something special. You see, I can call any young man here my son. My son, and I'm sure you won't mind, the child won't mind it. Nor will the father and the mother mind it, calling your child my son. But if some person, not knowing our relationship, wants to know, is he really your son? So then I have to tell you, no, you see, this young man, I like this little child. He reminds me of my son at home, my grandchild at home. So I call him my son. And he loves me like a father, like a grandfather, like an old uncle. So he calls me uncle, or he calls me grandpa, whatever. That is a relationship. But instead, if I said, yes, he is my begotten son, you know what I'm saying? What I'm insinuating? Horrible. I'm insinuating that the child is illegitimate. He's not his father's son, he's mine. I'm responsible for his birth. The worst swearing I can give him is that. If you know the meaning. So I just want to know what you are trying to emphasize. That's all. What you're trying to tell me. Please explain. And wallah, I tell you, you won't come across an English-speaking person who will explain to you. There's no harder blow you can give him than to plead with him, please explain what are you trying to tell me? What do you mean when you say begotten, not made? What are you trying to tell me? How did it come about? Tell me. The nearest, in all my experience, the nearest to an explanation came from an American. See, the American is very militant. Now he is. We must give him credit. He's a fighter. And a fighter is good material. He's the best material to deal with. Not diplomats, you know, beating around the bush and cutting and cutting favor with you and patting you on the back. Hypocrites. No, no, no. Let's have a straightforward a fight, an intellectual battle. And the American is good for that. He's a man. So an American, I had him, you know, with some people as visitors to the masjid. I'm, I happen to be one of the guides to the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere in my town, in Durban. And while I was guiding him, this subject cropped up, and I asked him the question, this question, because I was asking everybody, nobody answers it. I'm asking him, this American, I said, what do you mean says, when you say begotten, not made? Will you please explain? He said, yes, it means sired by God. So said, what? He said, no, no, I don't mean that, but you ask me what it means, I'm telling you what it means. <laughs> now you see why Allah reacts. Now you see why he reacts. Sayyid is an, a term used in animal husbandry. You see, they keep pedigrees of horses, and they tell you the father of this horse and the mother was so-and-so, and the great-grandmother of this horse was so-and-so, and the great-grandfather was so-and-so, and on and on. Pedigrees of horses, pedigrees of cows, bulls, the pedigree, so where they originate. Who was the great-grandfather of that bull? Where did it come from? The Brahman bull, it came from India, you know, a hundred years ago. And from that grandfather, we got this, then, and, 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 and this is his great-great-grandchild. Pedigree. They use this term in animal husbandry. Sired. This bull was, this cow was sired by a certain bull. That's what it means. This is actually what it means. Now, it is the Judaism. Now, that term, father, is not in the Quran. Beautiful word. But it's not there. I said, that is a miracle. The 99 names are miracles. But you say, look, if you want to discount them, discount them. The miracle is that the commonest, the most readily available, the one that is being dangled before him for 23 years, he doesn't catch it. And he makes us to eschew that word. Don't use it. You see, Rabbul Alamin. He's Rabb, he's Rabb, he's Rabb. He's not Ab, Ab, Ab. Miracle. Substance of the message. Allah says, another example I give you. Awalam yaral lazina kafaru. He says, do not the unbelievers see. These atheists, these agnostics, the people who deny the existence of God, can't they see? In other words, Allah expects them to see, to be able to see, to witness. 
اولم يرى الذين كفروا ان السماوات والارض كانت رتقا that the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation ففتقناهما and he split them asunder who is he talking to who is he addressing kafir which kafir the badwins of 1400 years ago no 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 what can the poor man understand well what did he know about the universe about the creations of the heavens and the earth what did he know he only accepted whatever was said if this was allah's kalam amanna saddaqna we hear and we accept we believe this was iman that they had they didn't have a grasp allah is not addressing those unbelievers of the times of muhammad or the unbelievers in the congo or among the eskimos who might not believe in god no 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 he is talking to the men of science men of learning who are now expounding to the world the theory of creation that these astronomers with the mighty telescopes when they're looking into space and they're analyzing the the movements in the heavens and they're telling you as if they did it if they are the ones who are making these things this machine this clock to work this clock of the universe the way they explain it as if they are doing it such a person with his great learning he says that this universe came into being with a big bang billions of years ago because he is watching the universe and he is noticing that these heavenly bodies are receding from a central place somewhere is all going out in all directions moving away 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 like a balloon when you blow it gets bigger and bigger something like that is happening in the skies in the heavens these galaxies they are receding from us at a faster and faster speed at a faster and faster speed and once they reach the speed of light 186000 miles per second once they reach that speed we won't be able to see it anymore because the light that is coming from there it won't be coming anymore it's going away so we must discover bigger and better telescopes to see the sights the wonders otherwise we'll miss the bus so they say that this universe came into being with a big bang the big bang theory who says that the most learned men of science astronomers they say where did you get this funny ideas from this fairy tale about a big bang so no 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 it is not fairy tales these are facts demonstrable facts we can demonstrate it show you what is happening and from that we can conclude if we had a film and put in reverse gear we so we could see what is happening is all coming back again with the way it's going out the balloon if we can deflate it you'll see it all coming back to one central point and there was a big bang when did you discover this he said yesterday because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man what is 50 years nothing as an, an illiterate man in the desert a person who didn't know how to read or write a person who couldn't sign his own name he could have couldn't have known this could he he says no never impossible man doesn't know astronomy he hasn't got the instruments he hasn't got a telescope nothing in the desert and among an ummi people illiterate people and he is now telling you this man in the desert 1400 years ago kana taratkan fa fatakna huma and he split them asunder and you biologists people who study minute life microplotism the amoeba he says you know life originated in the sea water without this water no life and they tell you says look we look back in time in space he says look this is how life originated there was a time when this earth was a molten mass nothing could have survived here everything boiling boiling and over a period of billions of years you know the vapors went up and came down and the vapors went up and came down and start cooling this earth it took a billions of years and then started life germs plant life and all these things started at one time there was nothing and then it started where did life come from it says from the sea certain chemical actions the sun playing its part and life started from there 
Mm -hmm. When did you find this out? It's yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. An illiterate man in the desert, he couldn't have known that, could he? He says, no, never. He says, well, listen. He says, and he has made from water every living thing. Say, will you then not believe? Who? You, men of science, you, men of learning, you kafir, you atheist, you agnostic, why can't you believe? That this is not his handiwork. As Allah says, Awalam yakfihim, annan sanna alaykal kitaba yutla alayhim, inna fi thalika la rahmatan wa dhikra li qawmi yuminun. And these are signs, blessings, and a remembrance for a people who believe. That he might have written this. In a verse preceding this, verse 48 of Surah An-Kabut, chapter 29, he says, He says, You were not in the habit, O Muhammad, you were not in the habit of reading as if out of a book. Nor were you able to transcribe it with your right hand. In that case, these talkers of vanity, these babblers in the marketplaces, they might have had some reason to doubt. Muhammad was a learned man. He says, you see, he was in the certain university. And you know, now he's telling you these things, his theories. Yes, they might have some reason to doubt if he had been through that schooling, if the Arabs had some knowledge or understanding of science, learning, nothing. Allah shows you that he sends you an, an ummi prophet to an ummi people. Amazing. He chooses a nation steeped in ignorance, the whole of Arabia. There were no more than half a dozen people that could read or write. In the whole of Arabia, the nation is ummi to the core. And he chooses an ummi prophet. You know why? To prove to you that this is my work. This is I am doing. <laughs> Thomas Carlyle describes the people and what the Quran did to them. He says, a poor shepherd people, these Arabs, a poor shepherd people, roaming unnoticed in his deserts in the creation of the world. From the time Allah Bari Ta'ala created, since then, roaming unnoticed. Nobody gives you a second look. Nobody gave the Arabs a second look. You know, say, well, there's some interesting people here. They've got beautiful women there. Nothing, nothing. They won't give you a second look. A liability to anybody who'll take you on. You're a liability. What are they going to do with this? People who married the stepmothers, who buried the daughters alive, fratricidal wars over little, little things, killing one another, cannibals. What do you do with them? Alexander the Great passed you by. The Persians passed you by. The Romans passed you by. Nobody interested in this human rubbish. He said, a poor shepherd people, Thomas Carlyle says this, a poor shepherd people, Roaming unnoticed in his deserts in the creation of the world. See, the unnoticed becomes world notable. The small has grown world great. <laughs> within one century afterwards, within one century afterwards, Arabia is at Granada on this hand and at Delhi on that. Glancing in valor and splendor and the light of genius, Arabia shines over a great section of the world. He says, belief is great, life-giving. The history of a nation becomes fruitful, soul-elevating, great, so soon as it believes. Is it not as if a spark had fallen? One spark on a world of what seemed black and noticeable sand. But lo, the sand proves explosive powder, blazes heaven high from Delhi to Granada. What did it? This book of God. That shepherds and camel drivers, one of our cousins, a Jew, writing a book on medicine, he's having a dig at his Arab cousins. A Jew, he's writing about medicine, but he's having his own, he's having a dig at us. You know what he says? He says, goat herds and camel drivers sitting on the throne of the Caesars. 
This is what these Arabs, goat herds and camel drivers sitting on the throne of the Caesars. This is Allah's work. You see, not you. You couldn't have done it. Allah is showing you. He said, look, this is what I can do. He's having a dig. But I said, there can't be a greater tribute than that. That from that goat herds and camel drivers, Allah made you supreme, made you to rule half the known world. This is his book. This is what he did. And it can do the same once more again. It's a book, a miracle of miracles. Another example. In Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse 36. Allah describes about sexes in the vegetable kingdom, in the animal kingdom, and of things that we don't know, which are all recent discoveries. He says, Subhanallahi khalaq al azwaja kullaha. He says, Glory be to Him who has created mates of everything, mimma tumbitul ardu, of that which the earth produces, the vegetable kingdom. Wamin and fusikum, and from among yourselves, the animal kingdom, and wamin malayalamu, and of things that you don't know. Mates of everything. It's a recent discovery that even plants, flowers have sexes. There are some flowers that have male and female in itself. There are other plants and trees, they are separate sexes. Like the date palm. The male tree is different from the female tree. I'm sure you Arabs know that. See, we didn't know that. Mankind didn't know that. In the time of the Prophet, they didn't know that. Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, he saw some Arabs, see, some of his children, the Arabs, little children, they were taking some flowers from the male tree and they were hitting on the female plant. So when Nabi asked them, asked the people, he said, why are they doing that? He said, we don't know. He said, no, he said, we saw our fathers doing it. Now this was the pet explanation for all the superstitions. They're worshipping idols and images, he said, why? He said, we found our fathers doing that. When you do such and such a thing, you know, and horrible things, he said, why? He said, we saw our fathers doing that. So Allah says, even if your fathers were ignorant fools, so now it seems like superstition. You're taking one plant and beating onto the other plant. It looks like superstition. So he says, stop it. See, the same type of argument which you use for your idols, your idol worship, now using for this. Stop it. And so they stopped it. And there was a crop failure that year in Medina. Very meager crop. So they came complaining to him. He said, oh, mom, look, what you told us to do, and look as a result, look at our dates. So when Nabi Karim, sallallahu alayhi wa he said, he said, look, you carry on with your beating of the plant. He didn't know, I don't know whether he knew, that this is a male plant and this is a female plant. They, Arabs, somehow they discovered by accident that sometimes when our children did that and that tree bear fruit in abundance. So he said, ah, it is very good. So very good. They started doing it, keeping it going. Now they discovered, he says, no, if you don't do that, because they didn't know about pollination, that the insects and the bees and the wind was doing the job, but it's not as good as you doing it physically, bringing them together, because the male plant can't come and walk and meet the female plant. Same thing in the purpose. He said, papaya, purpose, beautiful fruit. You see, I planted, I love this fruit. I at one day and very tasty, so I took the seeds and I threw in my garden. And two popo trees, they started, papaya, started growing. I don't know what you call it. Popos. Is it understood? Papaya. We said papaya. They started growing. And in time they bore fruit, luscious fruit, very tasty. So I took the seed and I planted again. Nothing. And I keep on planting the seeds, nothing is happening. Then I dried them up in ashes and planted, nothing happens. Then different, different ways of treating the seed. I tried and tried and tried. Nothing happens. And I can't understand. Why? What's happened? When I threw the thing first and it grew and now nothing is growing out of these seeds. The seeds look perfect. And it took me a long time to discover what when Allah says, Subhanallazi khalaqal azwaja kullaha. 
Mimma tumbitul ardu of the vegetable kingdom. Then I found that the popo tree is this papaya. There is a male tree and a female tree, like in the dates. The female tree has big, big flowers growing around the trunk. The, female, uh, the male tree has a small stalks and at the end of it are small, small flowers. The bees and the wind, that's the job of pollination. If there is a male tree around, it will be fertile. If there's no male tree, you can have a hundred female trees, you'll get the fruit. But the seeds are all useless, worthless. You can't plant the seeds. You can't have any more popos. Once they're old and dead, gone, finishes, finished. 1400 years ago, Allah bari ta'ala, through his ummi prophet is telling us, Subhanallah, glory be to him. Khalak al azwaja kullaha. Miracle, miracle of knowledge. I think I will end with this one last example for this evening. As I say, there are endless, wallah, there are endless. An illiterate a, 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 a layman like me, I can give you a dozen. I give you this book of Allah is a miracle of journalism. Journalism is a miracle, wallah, of embryology, what information it gives you. Psychology, look. Each and every man of science, I said, go to the book and look at the book. Analyze it from your particular form of knowledge that Allah gave you and look at it. It's a miracle from every point of view, Wallah. Mojiza is a miracle of miracles. So, I said, journalism. You see, I discovered this by accident. Most of these things I'm discovering by accident. But accidents are no accidents. Allah bari ta'ala is musabbibul asbab. He creates opportunities. If your eyes are open, somebody is speaking and he gives you a cue and you discover something. And somebody shows you something and you discover something. Because you are in the field. I live outside Durban, about 20 miles out. And every morning I was traveling at a road, in the road we call the beach road, like the Cornish, you know, on the seaside, into Durban. Now they have a freeway. So I don't use that Cornish road anymore, the beach road anymore. I take the freeway because it's faster, quicker, no obstruction to get to my work. So on the old road, I remember very, very distinctly that at a certain intersection, there was a news vendor, early morning newspaper, and he had a placard. Every morning a new placard, trying to sell his newspaper. So while driving, I read the placard, and I make up my mind, mm, the newspaper is not worth buying today. I don't want to buy the newspaper. According to the placard, what they're offering me, the news inside, I'm not interested. So I park my car in Durban, in the city. This is just on the outskirts of the city. In the city, I park my car, I take a walk to my office, and on the way, another intersection, I see the same newspaper seller, not the same man, but for the same newspaper, but there's a placard, it's different. I read the placard and I buy the paper. The same morning paper. The placard is different. Again it happens and again it happens. I don't want to buy and I buy. I don't want to buy and I buy. And I'm trying to think, why does it happen like that? I didn't want to buy and I bought. Why? So I said, yeah, right, right. I got the joke. The joke was that the place where at the intersection I'm talking about, on the Cornish, is a white area. Europeans, they live. So you are separated into races. And there that placard is catering for white readership. They are trying to bait the white man to buy the paper. Placard that will appeal to him, the white man. It doesn't interest me. Talking about Zola Bud, you know, one of our girl runners. I'm not interested in Zola Bud. So, says, man, she won, so what? Something else about some white person. So, Gary Player, you know, he won a million dollars. For his God. So what? I'm not interested. But as soon as I come into town, the Indian area, see, we are separated into races. And the placard there, same morning paper, but the placard there is something that appeals to me, so I buy. The newspaper is the same, not two different newspapers. But within it, there are different, different articles, different subjects, different topics. So they are now fishing. For the whites, a different placard. For the Indians, different placard. For the Africans, different placard. For the coloreds, different placard. What the fish will bite. They know how to catch fish. So I said, right, that is the game. 
why I'm getting caught out. I don't want it and I buy it. So the best journalist, the master journalist, is a journalist who can give you a placard that everybody will buy, not four different placards. He writes articles, he writes about topics, and if he advertises that one placard, he says the Pakistani will buy, the Bangladeshi will buy, the Arab will buy, the American will buy, everybody buys. If you can have a journalist like that in the Khalij Times or in the Gulf News, shh, the newspaper owners will never let the man go. You know that? Every day a placard which makes his paper everybody to buy is a master journalist. And Muhammad وسلم, is such a journalist. He's not him. He's a master journalist about the omnipotent, the omniscient, knowing his creation, knowing how to, how to bait you, how to catch you, how to get people to be attracted to his book. He's showing you. Our Nabi Kareem وسلم, is in Medina. He's surrounded by mushriks. His own people, mushriks. He's surrounded by munafiks. He's surrounded by Muslims. He's surrounded by Jews. He's surrounded by Christians. Five different groups of people. And you want to sell your newspaper. The idea, your proclamation. How do you catch fish like that? Five different groups of people. Listen. He says, not he, Allah is through him, using him as a mouthpiece. He says, Wahal Ataka Hadith of Musa has the story of Moses reached you? Think, think, a proclamation. Has the story of Moses reached you? The Jew wants to know. When he hears that, Wahal Ataka Hadith of Musa, what does he know about Musa? Watch, see how he makes a fool of himself. And the Christian, he says, look man, where is now doubling into un un unknown ground now? And the, the mushrik, he said, we'll watch the fun now, what the Jews and the Christians do to him now. And the Muslim, hungry, he says, yes, we want to know, what about Musa? Everybody is a god. everybody wants to know what? Say, Israel Naran, when he saw a fire, dramatization, visualization, you can visualize the scene. قَالَ لِأَهْلِهِمْ كُسُوا إِنِّي آنَسْتُ نَارًا لَأَلِّي آتِيكُمْ مِنْهَا بِقَبَسٍ أَوْ أَجِدُ عَلَى النَّارِ هُدَى He says, Behold, he tells his family, I see a fire. And perhaps I'll get a burning brand from there or some guidance at the fire. Illusions. Giving ideas. He's talking about fire. He's talking about guidance. Allah Bari Ta'ala is baiting him. He's actually baiting him. Because he's hungry for fire, he's hungry for guidance. You see, after the mishap in Egypt, when he had killed an Egyptian, in trying to defend a Jew, he slapped an Egyptian too hard, and he was a mighty strong man, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. He was no weakling. He gave this man a slap, and the man fell, and he died. And he had to flee from the country. He killed an Egyptian. Unforgivable crime. Here goes into Midian. And there he helps two girls in distress. They were trying to water the sheep and goats. And the other men folk were taking unfair advantage over the, because of their weakness. And Hazrat Musa alayhi salam goes to the rescue. And he helps them to water the sheep and goats. They go and tell the father. He says, you know, there's a young man at the well. And he's a very young, very handsome fellow. And he's very good hearted. And you know, dad, if you can have him with us, you know, he'll be a great asset. So go and bring him. So they bring him and Jethro, Shoaib, he makes a contract with Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. He says, look, my son, you know, we need a hand, somebody to help us. And if you will stay with us, he says, look, you work for me for seven years and I'll give you my daughter in marriage, hands in marriage. You can have her as a wife. Oh, the bargain is struck and he fulfills his seven years and he gets his wife and maybe another seven years. And he's got quarter dozen children or half a dozen children. Now he's getting bored. A man who lived in the city, in royalty. Now he's now in the desert looking after sheep and goats. For 10 years, 14 years, he's bored. He wants to get out. So he tells his father-in-law, says, look, daddy, I would like to go into the world and make way for myself. He said, look, my son, 
Your wife is your wife, your children are your children. And here is your share of your sheep and goats. You are welcome to leave. So he goes into the Sinai, he's moving from one place to another, one oasis to another. And he supposedly runs out of meat. He's got those dry bread, what the Jews eat, mastos they call it, you know. Unleavened bread of the Jews, no yeast. And that remains, you know, even it's hard as rock, but it's there, you can chew and chew and chew, it won't rot in a hurry. He's got that, but he's thinking about slaughtering a sheep or a goat. Start a fire, braise it, dry it up and carry on. But now he's procrastinating, we all do. Lazy, lazy. Today, tomorrow, today, tomorrow. I'll do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. Because it's hard job starting a fire. It'll take half a day. A piece of wood and a rock rubbing half a day. Mm -hmm. So he's procrastinating. Today, tomorrow. And it's towards evening. And he sees on the fire, Allah is baiting him. Allah is catching fish. Look, he's showing you what you want. He said, look, come, come. How else could he call him? He said, look, you come, come away. I want to talk to you. But he knows that this man at the back of his mind is thinking of fire. And he's also thinking, what is the next best place, oasis that he can go to? So he's baiting him with that. What he wants, he's hungry for, he's baiting him with that. So he says to his family, behold, I see a fire. Perhaps I'll get a burning brand from there, a burning coal. And then, shh, very easy to start a fire. <laughs> and no time, fire is started. Easy, see, easy fire. And some guidance at the fire to the next best oasis. Where men, good habitation, good people, hospitable people. He said, you go three, three days this way, two days that side, and you'll come across a people, very good people. Allah wants to give him a fire and a guidance. But he's thinking of other fire and other guidance. Illusion. Falamma ataha nudia ya Musa. And when he came to the fire, a voice was heard. Oh Moses, inni ana rabbuka fakhla na laik. says, I am your Lord and take off your shoes. Inna ka bilwadil muqaddasi tuwa. For thou art in the sacred valley of tuwa. Four verses, four ayahs. And what what he has told you. A miracle of journalism. How to attract people to listen to the message? A placard. A better. And allusion to fire, fire that burns in the hearts of man for 3,000 years, a guidance which is guiding mankind for thousands of years. Allah, this is how, this is the miracle of miracles. Now, what does it hold for us? This book is Allah's kalam, without doubt. And Allah Bari Ta'ala is challenging mankind. Pull, tell them. These people, these skeptics, these unbelievers, tell them. Kul la inijtama'atil insu wal jinnu ala an ya'tu bi misli hazal Qur'an. That if the gatherings of jinns and men, if they were to gather together to produce the like of this Qur'an, say la ya'tuna bi mislihi wa law kana ba'duhum li ba'din zahira. He says, you will never be able to produce the like thereof, even if you help one another, back one another with help and support. This is the book. Allah says, this is my book. What does it mean for us? It means that this book is an eternal book of guidance for you and for me, for the whole of mankind. It's the solution to the problems of mankind. But we are all sitting on this book like a cobra on a pile of wealth. We won't have access to it. We are reading it, we are deciding it for beautification, for sawab, 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 blessings, blessings. I say, you will get your sawab. There's no doubt about that. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said that when you recite the Quran, and when you say alif, lam, mim, say alif, lam, mim is not a word. There are three letters, alif, lam, mim. When you say alif, lam, mim, it says you get ten, ten, ten sawabs. 30 sawabs. While I'm uttering it, I got it so many times already. And you listening, you got it already. I said, Alif, Lam, Mim. 30, 30, 10, 10, 10. If I say it 100 times, 100 times 10. You got it. So easy. I believe in that. Sawab is there. Blessings are there. Benefits are there. But is that the purpose of the Quran? Just cheap sawab you want to get? Look, you can get a million-fold reward. This is 10 to 1. You, you want to do business? 
10 to 1, when you do million to 1, be high a hisab without accounting. I said, I do business with him, Allah. I like to do business with him. Be high a hisab. I don't want 10, 10, 10. You be satisfied with your 10, 10, 10. You will get it. I do business. With my Lord, he is prepared to give you be high a hisab. If you will only take it, accept it, and implement it in your life. It's a book of instructions. It's instructing you what to do. He's telling you this honor he has given you, share it with people. Don't be selfish. We are a selfish lot of people. Muslim, we are selfish. Wallah, we are very selfish. Everywhere. I asked my brother, you are very regular in your salat, mashallah. I want to know who you making salat for. Say, for my benefit. For your benefit. Mashallah. I say, you fast for one whole month. Say, yes. I say, for whose benefit? He said, my benefit. Yes, yes, your benefit. He says, you give zakat. He said, yes. For whose benefit? He said, my benefit. You go for hajj. He said, yes. For whose benefit? He said, my benefit. Everything you're doing for my benefit, my benefit, my benefit. I said, what are you doing for other men? What are you doing for him? For the unbeliever. You believe he's going to hell? The mushrik. He said, yes. Definite. He said, definite. Allah says so. One thing he will not forgive is shirk. And they're going to go to hell. He said, yes. What are you, you doing to save them? Nothing. So Allah will be very happy with you. They're not his makhluk, not his creation. Allah will be happy. You allow them to go to hell and you did nothing. You know, he gave us a slogan. 1400 years ago, he gave the Muslims a slogan. We call it talbiya in Arabic. I don't know literally what it means. But this is what I learned when I came, when I went for Hajj in 1983. I was hearing words, you know what people do when they go around the Kaaba, they read Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik, I was hearing and I, more or less, I learned that. But I didn't see the import, the implication of that, I didn't see it, until when I started going around myself. Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika Laka Labbaik, Inna Alhamda, Wa Ni'mata Laka Wal Mulk, La Sharika lak. And I found that by the time I finished off, and the people finished off, the dullest, dullest of us, the people with little intelligence, the least of us, everyone, by the time he finishes, he knows the words, La Sharika Lak, La Sharika Lak, La Sharika Lak. So what is that? You're telling Allah that he has no associates, he has no partners, he has no equals, he has no compeers. That's what you're saying, La Sharika Lak. La sharika lak. But this is not true. This is not true. Because as soon as you return from where you come, there are mushriks abounding. There are more people on God's good earth who are worshipping men and monkeys, elephants and snakes today. Worshipping shaitan today than the worshippers of Allah. And you said, la sharika lak. We all take from Makkah, Medina, we take with us Zamzam water from Makkah, we take dates from Makkah, and we buy a lot of things very cheap in Makkah, and we load ourselves and we take them home, and we take the title Haji. We are the Haji. I did Haji. I said, you know, this title, I was thinking it was easy. You know, you go in a plane, comfortable air-conditioned planes, and you have everything provided, and air-conditioned hotels, and you become a haji, so, so what? But wallah, I tell you, I can testify that if you've been through the process, you deserve the title haji. You deserve it. It's an ordeal, wallah, it's an ordeal. We are doing it for Allah's sake. If a man paid me a million to go through that again with my wife and child, I'll never do it. But for Allah's sake, I will do it. What do you have to go to the jam what do you call the place where you stone? <laughs> you know, I tell you. Somebody hit me with a stone on my forehead, bleeding. I lost my watch. My watch came off. I lost my shoes. 
I fell down. Had it not been for some Pakistanis, I tell you, Allah, I would have been a dead man. You wouldn't have seen me here today. Yeah, because once you fall, it's finished. You can't get up. I'm physically quite a fit fellow, but once you are down there, you are finished. Some Pakistanis helped me, alhamdulillah. I lost a thousand dollars. It was around the big belt I had. It was all cash, and that thing came out. <laughs> That's, the, once before, the day before, or that morning, I went, and I saw, I saw something there. Shh, we were wanting to go, my wife and my daughter and myself. And I saw people as if they were on fire. People, you know, that they're making a charge. Charge, you know, like it says, charge of the light brigade. You know, to people, they gather together and they're charging through people. I said, what do you do? Want to hit shaitan? We are human shaitans all abounding. <laughs> Allah, shaitans all over. So we retreated. But now we have to go through the process, otherwise I'm not a haji. So we made a second attempt, and at the second attempt, all these things happen. Not for a million, but for Allah's sake, we do it. I say, I deserve the title Haji, okay? But don't waste it on me. This is what we take. Some some water, dates, goods, and titles. But the talbiya, the talbiya, you said, la sharika lak. This is the slogan. The United Nations, they have the different commissions, and every year they come out with a slogan. This is water year. Save it. Use it. Don't abuse it. This is the A, this is the year for the aged. It says, an old age home is not her destiny. Your mother, when she grows old, don't put her in an old age home. This is year for planting trees. Wherever they pass a resolution, the whole world of the United Nations, wherever they are, they talk about the same thing, water, 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 trees, 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 old aged people, old age. This is the purpose of a slogan, carry it out. 1400 years, we are crying, la sharika lak, la sharika lak, and we leave it behind. The thing that we are supposed to take with, we are supposed to bring with, we leave that behind, and we bring dates and some some water. Yes. Because wherever you go, in India, you Hajis, you Pakistanis, you go to West, you go, wherever you go, in South Africa, there are people doing shirk. In all directions, shirk, shirk, shirk. You and I are supposed to find them. So, la sharika lak, you are supposed to tell them, la sharika lak, Allah has no associates, don't associate anybody, be, any being with him. This is your job. We are supposed to do, we are supposed to stand in a marketplace. Doing Allah's work. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the example. He used to retire to Ghar Hira, Jabal al Nur, before Nubuwa. He used to go there sometimes alone, sometimes with his dear wife, Ummul Mu'minin Khadija al Kubra. He used to spend days and weeks there at times to commune with the Almighty. What was actually happening, the details, I do not know. What was the details about that experience of his? It's only after Nubuwa we have a detailed record of what transpired. What was happening between him and his Lord, I don't know. But on the 27th of the month of Ramadan, don't start questioning me about the 27th. This is generally accepted. On the 27th of the month of Ramadan, when he was 40 years old, Allah Ta'ala sends his angel, Akhi Jibreel, to him in the cave and commands him in his mother tongue, Iqra, which means read, or recite, or rehearse, or repeat. And our Nabi Karim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being an ummi, he says, ma ana biqari. There's a testimony that he can't read, he's telling. He says, look, ma ana biqari. He said, I'm not learned. So the angel of God commands him a second time, Iqra. Again he pleads, he says, ma ana biqari. He's terrified. The third time the angel of God says, Iqra, bismi rabbi kalladhi khalaq. So read in the name of the Lord and Cherisher who created. Now he grasps that what he was required to do was to repeat. Because this Arabic word Iqra, I'm given to understand, means to read, to recite, to repeat, to re rehearse, to repeat. And he repeated the words. Iqra, bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Read in the name of the Lord and Cherisher who created. Khalaq al-insana min alak. He said, he who created man from a mere clot of congealed blood. So he said, Khalaq al-insana min alak. He said, Ikra wa rabbuka al-akram. He said, read, and the Lord is most bountiful. So he said, Ikra wa rabbuka al-akram. He said, Allah zi allama bil kalam. 
is he who taught the use of the pen. So it's Allah the Allah Mabil Kalam. So Allah Mal Insana Malam Yalam. He says, taught man that which he knew not. So it's Allah Mal Insana Malam Yalam. As soon as the angel departed, he is terrified, sweating all over. He runs home some three miles south to his dear wife, Ummul Mumineen Khadija Dul Kubra, and he says, cover me up, cover me up. When he gets out of his excitement, he explains to her what he had seen and what he had heard. But from that day onwards, he didn't go back to the mount. This is his example. He didn't go back anymore. No more. Finished. With Ghara Hira, Jabal Nur. Finished. What is he doing? He's in the marketplace. He's in the bazaar. Soup, soup. He's in the bazaars. What is he doing? He's accosting people. So, Salaam Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Say, Akhi, where you come from? He says, Yaman. He says, you know, Allah has revealed to me that he is but one Allah and I'm his messenger. Another man, Salaam Alaikum. Salaam Alaikum Salaam. Say, Akhi, where you come from? He says, Yathrib, Old Madina. He says, you know, Allah has revealed to me that he is but one Allah and I'm his messenger. Like a madman. Little wonder they call him Majnoon. Allah had to testify. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. Say, by the grace of thy Lord, your companion is not mad or possessed. They're thinking he's mad. But he's doing the job, his master's job. This is where you and I are supposed to be. Allah tells us, Lakat kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana. Say, most certainly in the apostle of Allah, you are the best exemplar. This is the example he set us. You and I are supposed to stand in the marketplace, proclaiming the unity of God. All the mushriks are abounding around you. Call them. He said, Rama is God, it's a la sharika luck. He said, Krishna is God, it's a la sharika luck. He said, Jesus is God, it's a la sharika luck. He said, Buddha is God, it's a la sharika luck. This is your job, my job. But I know you are terrified. <laughs> you are terrified. Me too. I'm telling you, it's a terrifying thing. You know, today nobody will stone you. Wallah, if you did that, nobody will hurt you physically. Then what are we afraid of? Of ridicule. What will people say? Say, so, Didar has gone off his rocker. Didar is mad. The Sheikh is mad. Dr. Billa is mad. Yes, we are afraid of that. You know that? We are terrified. People will call us mad. Thinking maybe you had a little tipsy. You might have taken something to drink or have taken some drugs. Then look at him. This man standing in the marketplace in the street corner shouting, Allahu Akbar, shouting, La Sharika Lak. He's mad. We are terrified of that. I said, you know, there is another way. You can get out of the difficulty. We discovered it. You see, necessity is the mother of invention. Necessity. You want to do something? Then you find ways and means. You know, I can't do it. I can't stand there in the marketplace. The nearest I got to that was in Mombasa, at a place called Mombo Tayari. People who know Mombasa, they might remember. There's a bus stop. I went and delivered lectures in the, in, in the, market, in, 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 in the bus stop on, 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 on a drum. I stood on a drum, and with a mic in my hand, I started lecturing. Because the people there, they were doing that kind of thing, it encouraged me. But in Durban, I can't, I can't. in London, I can't do it. I did it there because it looked like everybody was mad, like me, so it didn't matter. I said the second best thing. I said, necessity is the mother of invention. We invented an idea. He said, look, you know, today we are able of Capturing these jinns, jinns, you know, old people, they talk about, you know, making, we say, tabe, you know, controlling jinns, that you can call them and make them to do things. Like Aladdin is a wonderful lamb. You rub the lamb and the jinn comes along and you tell him what to do for you. That kind of people, you know, there's jinns under your control. These modern jinns, TV stations, radios, TVs, TVs, monitors, VCR. They are jinns under your control. I said, use them, man. You can't do it yourself. So we said, look, I'll show you. It is so easy. Look. In Durban, 
a country in South Africa, you know the land of apartheid, a racist country, very oppressive. The whole world this is like the polecat of the world, stinking. That nation stinks. My nation stinks. But that nation gives me this freedom. Look at this. He's given me that freedom in the streets, in the shops, in the bazaar. Look what I'm doing. I put the monitor in the window. <laughs> you know, 24 hours a day, I can make it to do the work. Be that is talking. 10 hours a day, 20 hours a day. The machine, I make the machine to do the job. The gin under our control. I say, use him, man. We are using him. Look. And nobody objects. Nobody says, D that is mad. Nobody says, because I'm not there. But I'm doing the job in the marketplace. That's outside. It's outside because inside the place is full. This is another picture of the outside. Muslims and non-Muslims, they're listening to the message. The message of they're getting entertained. And they're receiving the message. Inside the shop, inside, people sit in comfort. People sit in comfort and watch inside, the same thing. We have a monitor inside the shop, we have a monitor outside. When the place inside is full, they say, let them watch outside. Look, there's so many ways of killing a cat, if you want to. Look at it. Then in that color-conscious country, racist country, we use the masjid as a bait. You know, Allah baited Hazrat Musa with the fire. So we bait these people to come to the mosque. What for? They think they'll see, come and see something nice and funny in the mosque. They don't know the difference between a mosque and a temple. So when we say visit the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere, they think it's a temple. This is another name for a temple, a synonymous term for a temple, a Hindu temple. So they think they'll see all the monkey gods and elephant gods and snake gods all lined up. One English lady on a world tour, when she came into the masjid and when we explained to her things, she said, you know, I expected to find a funny oriental museum a la carte, meaning that a monkey got for Monday, an elephant got for Tuesday, a snake got for Wednesday, all the gods lined up. But instead, she says, I found the truth. Another Africana lady, the ruling race, she brings her daughters during the school holidays. And she looks around the mosque and she is disappointed. What she came looking for? She says, where are the cows? You know cows, bakara, <laughs> milking cows, cows. I said, madam, have you lost your cows? She said, no, no, no. I promised to show them to my daughters. I said, madam, you have come to the wrong place. So she said, but I promised them. I said, madam, is that my fault? You promised to show cows in the mosque? I said, no, no, no. You, will, you can see cows, my people, my people. Wallah, they are my people. I said, Amgeni Road, a little left couple of kilometers away from the masjid. In Amgeni Road is the largest temple in South Africa. And you'll see everything that you want to see. Cows, monkeys, elephants, snakes, everything. My people, they look like me, speak the same language. They have the same surnames like me. You know that? Morarji Desai. You heard the name? He was the prime minister of the largest democracy in the world. He's my maternal uncle, Mamu, we call him. He drinks his own urine, six to eight ounces every day. That's my nation. I'm not ashamed. Say, Allah took me out of it. I'm proud of that. Some Arabs, you know, Alhamdulillah, they came to my part of the country and they spoke to my people. They came to do business. And in the process, my ancestors, they said, these are good people. We also like to be one of you. They said, very easy. Give your hand. So my ancestors gave the hand and they became Muslim. Had it not been for the Arabs, the urine of the cow, I would still be sprinkling on myself. Yes. I said, therefore, my father, every time we met an Arab, as a young boy, he shook hands and he kissed the hands. And I also kissed every Arab's hand. My father was reminding me, he says, look, had it not been for these people, we would be where our cousins are still. So they're looking for cows in the mosque. They're looking for statues in the mosque. It's an opportunity. God sent opportunity to explain to them. There is no better place than to deliver the message than in the masjid. So we make the masjid as an attraction. Here, yeah. an African. A man who's looked down upon in South Africa. 
the, at the bottommost rung of the ladder, an African. This African is talking to European children. White, Jews and Christians. He's talking to them about the unity of God. Look, they have come there not for that, for a lesson in theology. They have come there to be entertained. Some superficial knowledge of Islam and we are doing the job. Look, if you want to do the job, Wallah, I tell you, there are endless opportunities. It's for you, my dear brothers and sisters, and we need your help in this, that you also take this up. Start opening your mouth. Share what knowledge Allah has given you. And in that, you don't have to be an expert. If you have one fact, our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Balliqwa anni walau aya. He said, deliver the message regarding me, even if you know one verse, one fact. Deliver it. Just talk, that one fact. Talk, 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 and Allah will give you more. This is the secret of learning. Give what you have, and Allah will fill you up with more. With these words, Mr. Chairman, and my dear brothers and sisters, I'm very, very grateful to the Department of Information for creating such, such wonderful opportunities for me to come along and talk to you. I had actually come to this part of the world to thank the people who had helped me in projecting me to America, rocketing me to America, to give battle to that great giant Jalut, Jimmy Swaggart. I had come along. That was, my, that was my real purpose in coming to this part of the world. But as soon as I arrive, there are hazards, dangers in every job. And my job, you know, because you're a talker, as soon as you come, it's now Mr. D-Dad, we want you on the radio. Now Mr. D-Dad, we want you on, on TV. Now Mr. D-Dad, come and talk to us. These are the hazards of my occupation. I just can't help it. And so therefore now, you see, I had to plan. This lecture, I said, now, as soon as I talk, I must run from here to Dubai, <laughs> get away from here, because you people won't give me peace in the hotel where I am. So immediately after this, if people will allow me to get out as quick as possible. There's a motor car waiting outside to drop me, I don't know how many miles from here, to Dubai. And there, if I deliver a lecture again, I must run. I have to run away from my fans. You know, I, I like it, I enjoy it, but it's a bit too much for this old machine. You know, it's 70, year, 70, and four days, 70 years and four days old now. So I hope you'll have a little extra mercy on me, kindness on me, to allow me to go out peacefully. Wa akhirud dawan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.